but she and her caregiver got it. She's doing better. This nine-year-old woman, I've always been a caregiver, very ill. Mm. Yeah. Okay, everybody, welcome to Bible study on the second Sunday of Epiphany, uh, Sunday, January 17th, and uh, we are fast approaching spring. Just mm -hmm. kidding. Every day is one day closer. <laughs> when you got nice days like this. That's Every right. day is one day closer. I don't want to social distance from spring. <laughs> One day closer to spring, one day closer to Jesus' return. Well, let's uh, I have the prayer of the day here on the sheet. Let's start with the prayer of the day. Thanks be to you, Lord Jesus Christ, most merciful Redeemer, for the countless blessings and benefits you give. May we know you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more dearly, day by day, praising you with the Father and the Holy Spirit. One God, God, now and, and forever. forever. Oh, See, day by day. Yeah. Day by day. Yeah, pretty poetic in my time. Um, this is this is a great Samuel text, uh, as I mentioned in the newsletter, um, and the call of Samuel. And I think it's too bad we don't get to read the whole the whole story, but we're gonna read. It says, it says 1 Samuel 3 through 10, but let's go ahead and read 3 through, through 20, and I'll, I'll go ahead and get us started here. Now, when the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord Eli, the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. He said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for I called you. But he said, I did not call my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears it tingle. Now I just keep going on here. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him about that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swore to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli, but Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, he said, here I am. Eli said, what is it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also, if you hide anything from me all, of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet, prophet of the Lord. I don't know why the lectionary cuts it off at verse 10, because you kind of get the real meaning of it. You only get you only get part of the story. You're left hanging on what's gonna happen with 
Mm -hmm. oh, God, with that. Eli's response. To me, this has always been a an interesting text that, that God is punishing Eli because his sons were, I mean, any any pastor who has pastor's kids, they do mm -hmm. they do things that are, you know, I mean, is it I've, it's always bugged me a little bit, but the, you know, God does something. He's, uh, God obviously wants Samuel as his prophet, mm -hmm. and and the whole the whole call narrative is about Samuel being able to position himself in order to hear. The irony is God doesn't want Eli, but Eli is still the one that helps Samuel hear, and Samuel will interpret what God is saying. So in a way, Eli is still being faithful to to god's voice which you know to me it's like that doesn't seem fair to eli that he gets pushed aside but that's what what god wanted well eli had not condemned or chastised his children uh, but the the scary part of it is when god said doesn't matter what Eli does, I'm never going to forgive him. Yeah. And that seems so harsh, harsh and, and ungodlike mm -hmm. because, you know, everything we read about our God is that he's a forgiving God mm -hmm. and, and a loving God. Now, it, you can read this that it doesn't really say he's not going to forgive Eli. He's not going to forgive Eli's household. So, and, uh, and that was part of Jewish custom too. I mean, yeah. when when a son did something, it brought shame upon the whole the family. generations. And you know the the sins of the father to the seventh generation. You know, it it. Uh, Thank, thank God for Jesus. So what do you, what do you make of the fact that, um, now verse seven, now Samuel did not yet know the Lord and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him, but yet God still mm -hmm. is persisting that Samuel will be the prophet. I mean, to me, to me, that's really interesting. Um, He's going to call Samuel. It's not based on knowing yet. It's based on something entirely different, perhaps. And I, you know, the same thing happens kind of with David. Yeah, I think it's also following the, like, last week with the baptism of Jesus. We talked a lot about right after Jesus was baptized, this spirit who came down and made this big proclamation threw him in the wilderness. Right. So it's like once you're called, it's not easier after that. Yeah. So the, the first call, the first message Samuel ever has to deliver is not an easy one. And so it's just another exam example of like accepting the call. And then it's a really hard call, but God is with you. Well, I'm also wondering if if God has higher expectations of those who know him than he does of those who do not. Because Eli obviously knew him and Samuel did not. So. Well, Samuel was really a, you know, a gift from God to Hannah who prayed and had faith in God. And mm -hmm. so in one sense, God is taking care of his own gift to the world and and see as you pointed out you know there's david you know there's mary there's there's many people that god picks for some reason to to shine on and to you know, dwell in mm -hmm. yeah so uh, this the context of this story falls in the the call story in john one of uh Andrew and Peter, um, who find Philip and uh, and invite him to to be a disciple, to come and see. Mm -hmm. And I, it harkens back to the 
<clears throat> to the uh, saying that you know if the Bible was filled with perfect people, it wouldn't mean a, it wouldn't mean a darn thing to me. Uh, <laughs> you know, I wouldn't be able to relate to it. And because Samuel, I mean, yeah, God chooses people that that are not perfect and have and have flaws. Uh, those to show us that uh, it's never too late in our life and also it doesn't matter what we've done we can be forgiven if we truly ask God and truly repent for things that we've done yeah anything else you want to lift up from first Samuel is, is, does Eli have more history before this story? Do we hear what his life as a prophet was like? It almost feels like the, yeah. maybe like Eli, Eli knew this was coming. Eli doesn't seem surprised to me that God is giving him this message through Samuel. Well, his, you know, oh, yeah, you read chapter two, it's obvious yeah. that he knows because he does he, he does rebuke his sons but he uh but they don't listen to him and uh that uh so he yeah he was aware of what was going yeah. on i feel like god had probably given him a lot of warnings before this one the other thing i i think is peculiar peculiar is the fact that he comes at night mm. And he comes, he comes when Samuel settled down um, for the evening. Uh, you know, if you know anything about children, which we all do, you know, it's not until they settle down that you're able to, to really get through to them. And, uh, and that, I mean, the world, especially back then, was a much quieter place at night. It is. And, uh, or even in our, <clears throat> our own households, you know, it, it's usually the, the calm, calmness where it's much easier to, to communicate. I also wonder, too, if God is, is not saying to Eli, you know, it, makes a point of saying Eli whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see um, if that had anything to do with with what was going on or if even that was a metaphor for um, faith I don't know yeah Although Eli perceived, he, he was blind, and yet he perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Well, Psalm 139. I can read that. Lord, you have searched me out. Oh, Lord, you have known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You trace my journeys and my resting places and are acquainted with all my ways. Indeed, there is not a word on my lips, but you, O oh Lord, know it all together. You encompass me behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot contain it. For you, you yourself created my inmost parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will thank you because I am marv marvelously made. Your works are wonderful and I know it well. My body was not hidden from you while I was being made in secret and woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my limbs yet unfinished in the womb. All of them were written in your book. My days were fashioned before they came to be. How deep I find your thoughts, O oh God. How great is the sum of them. If I were to count them, they would be more in number than the sand. To count them all, my lifespan would need to be like yours. So 
It's almost like the psalmist is is reflecting on the complexity of of his own of his own life and his own physical body. Well, that, that's what I find so marvelous about this passage is that you can read it and it means it to you and I can read it and it means it to me. Everybody can read that because God created us all, you know, wonderful. And mm -hmm. the way he wanted us to be created for, for some reason. And it's, it's so amazing that, you know, we're all created so differently, but yet we're a magnificent work of, of God's hand. Mm -hmm. so. yeah there's nothing <clears throat> I don't know about biologically speaking in the world but I don't think there's anything more more complex biologically speaking than the human body in this world I mean there's there's a lot of amazing things that God has created but biologically speaking the human body is probably one of the most complex organisms that there are that there is on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. Glenn and I were I was we were chatting yesterday or or Greta was a, just the whole just the whole concept of consciousness and and you start thinking about what is what does it mean to be a conscious aware human being, I mean, what gives us that consciousness? I mean, that, that consciousness comes from, from somewhere. We're, we're more than just a plant, you know, that's growing up out of the ground. We're, we have, we have reasoning abilities. We have discernment abilities. We have, you know, where does, where does that come from? And, and that's a whole nother dimension. I think that is a gift from God that, that is not ex not necessarily it doesn't have an explanation behind it it's mysterious well and that's why i every day when i thank god for the differences in the world i i'm amazed by the fact that people could look at the human beings around them and the world that god has created and think that it just happened Yeah, it's, it's, you know, creation is creation an accident, or is it uh, intelligent, intelligently designed? Mm -hmm. um, I think the whole universe is intelligently designed, and I think, I think there's, there are things beyond this earth that we don't know about, and we don't understand, and nor, nor should we or will we. Um, but the complexity of, of the universe and the complexity of our lives is, can only be from sourced in God. And I don't know, you know, if you start any atheist, you sit them down and try to, try to talk to them about that. I don't know how you can't believe in higher power. I don't know how you can't believe in God yeah. and a creator. You guys are quiet today. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I guess I struggle with the other side of that, with um, those who would, um, those who see science as the enemy, almost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. who, who, you know, I mean, what we have discovered about the human body, um, and you know, the intricacy of the human body and and the intricacy of the universe and all that's going on in the universe and um, to me it just it is more mind blowing it, it it broadens me and my understanding and my perspective of God uh, and and what that can all be about mm -hmm. and uh, you know that uh, and so. I'm just, uh, you know, that's part of it too, is that God has given us these 
these this this wonderful brain um, among among all people and um, among people who can who can learn about and and discover new things about our body about the universe uh, all the time and uh, or just to be able to to figure out this virus and to be able to come up with a vaccine so quickly I mean that's amazing I think you know the more we learn the more we understand how little we really know mm -hmm. about the universe about things that are going on but you see the, the miracle that uh, God has given us through the intelligence he's passed on to the people of the scientific world or you know mechanical things it's just mm -hmm. it's just a, amazing how uh, you know the, the world is changing and changing so rapidly because we're we're learning more and more all okay. the time but I don't really see the animosity from Christians towards scientists as I see it the other way around. You know, I see it both ways. Yeah. I've heard it. I, I hear it both ways, Rod. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I have, a, you know, I don't understand scientists either. I mean, I know a lot of scientists who, who you know, their work and their research deepens their faith. Now, right. You know, and so, um, we have Carl Sagan, for example, who was, I don't know if he was a full, full blown atheist, but he, he's certainly, and then, and then Stephen Hawking, but in, you know, a brief history of time, you know, in the preface of his book, he, he writes about, you know, physicists can explain the how, they can't explain the why. Mm -hmm. And it's that why question that I think the theologian, that's where theology comes in, be, into play. And I think, I, you know, I, I think if we have more dialogue between, between science and theology, we'll, we'll really get somewhere. Um, and I think we can really, you know, enlighten the world a lot, a lot better if the two would play nicely together. <laughs> Wouldn't this be a great world if we all played nicely together? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, and I guess that's the other thing when, you know, and just how we talk about this and, and because I listened to a show or read about, uh, read about, uh, you know, that the, part of the reason that this virus, I mean, that the vaccine was able to be developed so quickly is that there's been research going on with these RNA, um, developing RNA vaccines and how we can do this for three, four years at least. Mm -hmm. And um, and again, the, the remark, you know, how remarkable is it that that was going on <laughs> even before this pandemic hit. Yeah, well, you know, we that, enough foresight. that's the part that astounds me is here there were, and they were, they were getting no recognition at all for what they were doing. They were doing this remarkable research and getting no research, you know, getting the little or no recognition for it. And then all of a sudden they're, uh, you know, well, just thrown into the middle of it and, uh, you know that that was going on look at the technology changes that we had you know setting us up for this the, the wonders of zoom mm -hmm. and you know things like that can you imagine what this pandemic would have done to the world without zoom from well, many of us were going crazy but because of zoom we could at least communicate and we you know, we have family meetings over Zoom, which, you know, doesn't make us feel near as isolated as it, it would have without that. I mean, you, just calling somebody on the phone and talking to them, you know, helps you connect, but being able to see them. Right. Uh, so, you know, this, this pandemic was one of the evils of the sinful world, but 
God helped us get through it with, you know, the technology that was prepared for us before it. Mm -hmm. And as you said, the, the scientific, you know, uh, things that were going on to help us be prepared to come up with something quickly to, uh, to help us get through that. Right. Yeah. For sure. Mm -hmm. Jump to First Corinthians twelve. Here I can read that. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, chapter first letter, chapter six. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is meant not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is said, the two shall be made one flesh. But anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Shun fornication. Every sin that a person commits is outside the body. But the fornicator sins against the body itself. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. This is what do you, I, I, what do you want to know? I, <laughs> well, How I, I, huh? I just remember that, uh, and he had, he retired my, my junior year of seminary, my first year of seminary. But, and so I never got to hear this speech, but uh, his, he was affectionately known as Uncle Dudley, and he was president E.C. Kent of oh, you, the Trinity Seminary. Yeah. And yeah, I think if I told you, know, that he gave this um, before the seniors would graduate and go out, um, go out on their first call, he was known for giving the giving his masturbators and fornicators speech to all the seniors. Cool. <laughs> so every time I read this, you know, every time this comes up, I think of good old Uncle Dudley and I would have got to walk away. Well, I just, you know, this, this really, I think, speaks to what was going on in Corinth at the time. Right. I mean, Paul was Paul was speaking to these to these people. I mean, prostitution was pro, prostitution and gluttony were were two things that were not uncommon in Corinth. Mm -hmm. And so now he's addressing he's addressing how he's addressing those two issues. But well, he's using those two issues to lift up that you know what we do with our body in terms of you know, eating and, and whatever else that's put that behind us because we live, we should live, our body should live for the Lord. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not, I have a note in here that says, do not read at wedding. <laughs> <laughs> Good call. Because <laughs> when he says, for it is, <laughs> for it is said the two shall be one flesh yes. he's not talking about a married couple he's That's talking right. about some illicit uh hookup here and um anyway well i think you know and it just speaks and it's one of the struggle of you know when we talk about diversity in our culture uh you know, because Corinth being a, a commercial crossroads of, of the Roman Empire, 
was had great diversity and you had all these different religions uh, coming in and being coming into to Corinth and and uh, you know, and a lot of them were religions where uh, temple prostitution was common practice mm, of course yeah where mm. um, that was how you uh, you know would guarantee fertility of uh, of the soil I mean it was a rule common common rule uh, practice in, in, in those kind of uh, rural religions. I mean, it was one of the reasons that um, you know, the, 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 the uh, Temple Bay, I mean, and the, and the struggle that the Israelites had against, um, you know, those who worship Baal in, uh, in the Old Testament. And, uh, so oh, it was continued. <laughs> Paul really frames this in the in verse twelve, um, yes. and he says, "But I will not be dominated by anything." That that word "dominated" is is a is um, a derivative of the word "enslaved," mm -hmm. and yeah. and what Paul I think is saying is, "I won't be dominated by the things that bring shame upon the body. I will be dominated by." And then he ends it with. For you were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Um, you know, Christ, Christians should be dominated by God's grace, and and I think that's that's really. And then all the stuff in between this this sandwich here is just a bunch of stuff that's contextual for with Corinthians. So, I mean, you, you could, it, it's not a, an exhaustive list of bad things you could do to your body. I mean, he could have talked about drugs. He could have talked about all kinds of other vices, but, um, you know, if we're really to glorify God through our bodies, then it's to realize first and foremost that, that we are slaves to God's grace, that God's body, Christ's body is the one that paid the, the price for us. Yeah, I think if you... Right, all right, if you just threw out verses 13 through 18 and went from 12 to 19, you'd have the whole concept. And to me, even though Paul was was never married, never had children, you know, his congregations were, were and these are to me, these are loving words from a father to his children. Children. His, you know, like to God, to us, from Paul to his community. It, because they're telling you, you know, God allows you to do anything, but everything isn't beneficial for you. Right. You know? And don't be dominated by things because you want them so much or desire them so much. And, and remember, Christ died for us. Christ paid that sin. So... You know, accept it and you know and, and don't keep doing the or don't do things you know aren't good for you. I can remember you know Pastor when I was talking about the, the theologian or the pastor that before the seniors went out, well, it reminded me back when I was in basic training and we got our first pass to, to go home and the I said, now, you know, you guys are going to go home and you're going to see this sweet young thing and probably be married before I ever see you again. You know, it is, you know, you, it's the loving words of somebody who cares about you, who wants to tell you, you know, and warn you, I guess that, uh, against temptation. Yes. Because yeah. there's, there's temptation everywhere in this world. I was going to mention, Glenn, this, you know, the proper understanding. I mean, if you could interpret this well so people can understand it, this wouldn't be a bad text for first step. Um, you know, to understand that, you know, there is a higher power. Mm -hmm. um, and, and God is the one in control. Um, I mean, you know, even though, even though I'm not a 12-step program, uh, I need to hear that anyway. I think that that's 
that's something we all need to hear mm -hmm. that that uh, no matter no matter what god god loves you god god doesn't want you know you may think it's good for you but god loves you enough you know there's some tough love that needs to happen sometimes with people but it's out of it's out of love it's not out of you know i don't know yeah well and these these vices the examples he's giving are not that like right he's not saying sex is bad he's saying broken relationships are bad all of these examples he's listing are things that break relationships you know if you are not working on your marriage you're going outside the marriage that's gonna break the relationship you know so it's like if you want to be a healthy community you can't do whatever you think makes you feel good because ultimately you're hurting yourself in the community and again that was what was because that's i mean the interesting thing is that if you is as often the case with readings is that you know it's uh, you, you don't consider the whole context because it's, you know, the context of this is, the, you know, the first 11 verses of First Corinthians, he's talking about, about the law and, as it is practiced in the, in the Roman Empire, the Roman law, and how it, uh, and so, and the, and the Roman law was, uh, you know, was seen as, as the ultimate i mean it was you know that was what brought peace uh, uh and they were very proud of it um and uh but he is saying that it's not so when he's talking about the law here it's not necessarily the uh, the law of the old testament he's talking about the law of that's governing corinth at that time which is the roman law and then mm -hmm. chapter seven talks about the principles of marriage and uh, and what and basically saying what you were saying, Brett, Greta, about uh, you know how you know it is um, you know when you take that sexual practice outside the the bounds of marriage, um, you know the the people you hurt. Are, um, mm -hmm. are, are many. The other, the other thing I just, I would just lift up and this is a whole semester of learning, but he, when Paul talks about the body, I mean, he's really appealing rhetorically to the sense of these Corinthians, these Greek, these Greeks had an understanding of the body um, in terms of trying to attain the, the perfect body not unlike today. Um, but when he says in verse 16, do not, do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? When you, when you, when you hear that, you should automatically go to, to chapter 12 when he talks about the body of Christ, mm -hmm. because, because he's, he's setting up a dichotomy here of, well, not a dichotomy, but he's comparing this to, to, the body that we ought to be enjoined to, which is the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. So that's, there's a whole lot in between there, but um, he was very intentional, I think, when he said that. Right. For sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the fornicator sins against the body itself. It's like that could easily say the, you're, you're hurting the body of Christ. You're breaking the relationships. You're you're weakening this community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good times. <laughs> and this this next gospel text is is I always. I always find it to be kind of childlike, and I'll explain why in a little bit. But. Can I ask a question about, you know, the letters to the Corinthians, to the Romans, you know, somehow God allowed 
these letters to be preserved and kept for us. In the canon. Yeah. And we, you know, when, when Paul would write a letter to Corinth or Ephesus or, you know, was that copied multiple times and, you know, spread out to the different people or, you know, how was it, how was it saved for all the people? For perpetuity. Um, well, you know, that's a good question. I don't know in terms of the scrolls. I mean, sometimes uh, I know in the gospels, there's different, there's different recordings of it. So, and sometimes you get a nuance. That's why you have footnotes at the, at the bottom of your Bible, because one, one scroll might have one slight word out of place or whatever. Um, my guess is that, that they were copied, uh, re rewritten. I mean, and they would have had to have been handwritten. Um, and the, the way they came into being was, you know, in the early church when they would meet in their home, in homes, they would say, you know, we want to hear from, we want to hear from that. And read that letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians again. Yeah. And over time, that became significant for the early church. So it became part of when they canonized the these scriptures um it was it was kind of like the greatest hits you know and some things were left out and that's why we get the apocryphal uh scriptures which which were also read but they weren't read as frequently so they didn't become part of canon yeah so whatever was going on in the early church when they were reading these letters must have applied to them as well in a, in a real direct impactful way because if we were to if we were to try to canonize scripture today and we took a letter from Corinth, I can't. Say, I mean, would we would we put it in the canon? I don't know. I mean, maybe, but maybe not. Yeah. Well, we at least put these you know verses in there because it, it's a good warning. It's a good uh, no. Yeah. You know, maybe maybe you know maybe we ought to look at canon again and and some of the some of the letters, some of the sermons from maybe St. Augustine or whatever. And, you know, maybe that ought to be part of the Bible. I don't know, you know, mm -hmm. for its efficacy and, and mm -hmm. delivering the word. And, and that's why I think we refer to this as the living word, because, um, you know, this is our guide. But, you know, when we say sola scriptura, you know, scripture alone that's fine, but there's also there's also the, the word of God that comes through a community. Yeah, my favorite like response at the end of a reading, we used it in college, instead of saying the word of the Lord and everyone else says thanks be to God is for the word of God in scripture, the word of God among us, the word of God within us, there you thanks go. be to God. That the Bible is just a part of God speaking and working through us. I mean, as Lutherans, we call the Bible the inspired word of God, you know, and uh, it's canon. I mean, we lift it up, but we can't discount those other experiences either. And that's why we have preachers and I don't know, but they would have, they would have, someone thought that this was beneficial. And so it continued to be read, read and reread and probably rewrote distributed yeah well you could say that like the modern revised common lectionary is is the canon right like multiple denominations use it it's the same texts over and over somebody somebody relatively recently thought it was important enough for churches like us to hear once every three years yeah the only negative about that is you skip out on so many good right. things yeah mm -hmm. yeah you want to read John? Who's mm -hmm. John's turn, is it? Go ahead. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote. Jesus, the son of Joseph, from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. 
When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And Nathanael asked him, where, where did you get to know me? And Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, you are the son of, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, do you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God descending and descending, ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Every time I hear the story, I think of Nathan when he was about three years old. And he was fascinated with a vacuum. Mm -hmm. And he found out one day, he found out where the vacuum was, was stored in the closet. And uh, he, he, uh, he took my hand and he said, come, come, come see, come see. And uh, maybe it was two, I don't know. But he wanted me to pull that vacuum out because he was, he wanted me to vacuum because he was fascinated with that thing. And so every time I, I hear these words, come and see, I think of him trying to get me to get the vacuum out of the closet. Is he still that excited about vacuums? I wish he was. Yeah. <laughs> if he's really into it, he could come to my house too. Right. <laughs> I wish he was. Now it's the dog that's fascinated by the vacuum. So, but he can't speak. So. <laughs> Dogs usually hate vacuums. Yeah, Moose wants to fight it. This <laughs> sound, uh, this is the first time I ever thought about it, but it sounds so political. Have any of you seen the TV show West Wing? It mm -hmm. came out in 1998, it was eight seasons. Yeah, um, I've heard of it, I never watched it. Yeah, I saw like about five minutes of it probably. <laughs> but at one point, they're like flashing back to how this guy starts running for president. And so it's all these like, political guru you know they work on different people's campaigns and in different people's offices and um one of them's talking to his friend who's practicing at a law firm he's like yeah i'm gonna go see this guy up in new hampshire i'll let you know if it's good he goes sees jed bartlett talking to like a senior center or something he's flabbergasted in awe like this is the guy this is the one we're gonna pick and so he goes back to his friend who's like in the middle of a meeting at the law office and he just knocks on the door. He's soaking wet in the rain. He's like, it's him, he's got it. And so the guy just like leaves his law practice. And anyway, it was very dramatic. Um, but, you know, I don't know who Philip and Nathaniel were, but that's sort of like, we recognize that this guy has got something. We got to do it. Um, feel like, because I constantly believe that Jesus' ministry was a movement. It was starting the social movement to make the change that the people were had been waiting for, you know? Um, so like, you know, there's politics in here of, yeah, we think this guy could do it. And it, they didn't, you know, they learned and, you know, as Jesus did miracles and stuff, like recognized him as God. But I think at the beginning, they just saw that he had this like political magnetism that could really do good work for this movement that they were all really had been waiting for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, well, I, I mean, that uh, Nathaniel would use that. I mean, um, I mean, it's a, a very uh, political thing and, and something that, you know, we know Herod uh, was, uh, you know, didn't appreciate someone being called the king of Israel. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, um, yeah, or anyone who too. anyone who had anything negative to say yeah. about his regime. Yeah. You know, and uh, can like this? So, can yeah. anything good come out of Nazareth? That could be, you know, depending on where you're at. Can anything good come out of Utah? Like, yeah. why would we choose a guy from Utah? <laughs> you know, that that's sort of. Nazareth doesn't have any clout. Why would we choose a guy from Nazareth? It's like when I went to college in Augustana, Illinois, and uh, 
Like, you're from Nebraska? Because most, most of those students were from suburban Chicago. Mm -hmm. Like, you're from Nebraska? What, what's, you, you're from a farm? <laughs> you, you, you grow corn? I'm like, uh, no. <laughs> Fortunately, in those years, Nebraska football team was was uh, domin dominating. So I got I got to show them that there was more than just <laughs> corn from yeah. Nebraska. But I get a kick out of uh, Jesus saying, um, "Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit." Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. Israel was the after Jacob wrestled the angel of the Lord at Peniel, if you remember, and the angel struck him on the on the uh, hip hip socket, and he had a limp, and then he got renamed from Jacob to Israel. And if you know the story of Jacob, you know that Jacob stole the birthright from Esau. Mm -hmm. He deceived he deceived his father and his brother, and. Uh, so Jesus is hearkening back to, you know, and I, I wonder if Jesus looks at all Israelites as potential deceivers. I mean, I just, why did he say that is kind of what, on the, on the other hand, it's a way of saying, here's an Israelite who's, who's honest and worthy of following me. Yeah. Or, or he, he says it like he sees it or, you know, speaks honestly or. Uh-huh. I just, it's just one of those things where what, what's, it's, a, I, I believe Jesus said that, but why is that here? Why, what's the purpose of this? Why did it get remembered? Right. It's, it, um, I find it interesting. Well, it's, Nathaniel is comparing him as not only the son of God, but also the king of Israel, is what, going back to what Greta was saying, that's what the people were looking for, mm -hmm. a new king that would lead them. And that's exactly what Jesus was. He just wasn't the kind of king that they were looking for. Right. Yeah, it's almost like, you know, Jesus is describing who Nathaniel is. Well, here's an Israelite he went without the seat, and then, Vice versa, Nathaniel is saying is defining who Jesus is. He's confessing who he thinks believes Jesus is. So there's this kind of this interplay between the two of them being introduced to one another for the very first time. You know, I wonder. Jesus answered, "Do you believe because I told told you that I saw you under the fig tree?" you will see greater things than these. What are the greater things? Well, yeah. I mean, it, it, in, in John, it's the, the, you know, we don't have the, the great number of miracle stories, but, um, you hear um, you, the, the miracle stories are stories that put him you get water to wine. Well, and, and yeah, the, the water to wine, uh, but the, the main miracle stories in John put you put Jesus, he always put Jesus in conflict with the authorities. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, it, it was even you know, even the feeding of the 5,000 uh, and people following him, you know, I mean, they, he asked them again, the same question, basically the same question he's asking Nathaniel, you know, uh, or, or, you know, uh, you know, why are you, you following me because you, you, you're following me because I fed you and, and you know, you got full. Um, you know, is that, is that all you're expecting? Is that all you want? Is that all you want? Um, you know, uh, what, uh, what I can do for you in this world, uh, what I can do, you know, uh, and we think in terms of, of limitations mm -hmm. instead of abundance possibilities. 
Well, and, 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 and seeing God's abundance. But then there's the miracle of Lazarus that yeah. uh, John talks about. And that's just a miracle of love. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that got him in trouble too. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, he even says, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Those are the greater things in, that he particularly says. So, you know, the miracles, the, the growth of this movement, the actual, you know, uh, crucifixion and resurrection. The ultimate miracle, yeah. Heaven opened and angels of God ascending and descending, ascending and descending. Mm -hmm. Right, because there's great. there's not a lot of angels mentioned post Mary and Joseph, right? In the Gospels, there's not a lot of angels appearing. Not until the not until the empty tomb. Yeah. All right. Um. You know, I think to me, what that says is the, the boundary between God's kingdom and the earthly kingdom has been blasted wide open so that mm -hmm. that God can be can be seen and, and revealed. Um, and that to me is the greater the greater the greater things are the things in our life in which we see God's um, presence in the midst of this kingdom, the earthly kingdom. And that, I mean, that's maybe the sermon for Sunday. I don't know, but, um, you know, how do we see the greater, how do we see the greater things in the midst of, in the midst of uh, the darkness when we pretend we cannot see? It's like a pandemic. I'm getting kind of tired of talking about the pandemic. But, you know, how do we see God's blessings in the midst of, struggles mm -hmm. are we still how, do, how are we still motivated to follow to be disciples when because again i mean these guys just dropped everything these guys just left everything like you were saying greta it's a movement that was compelling enough for them to just get behind and work you know they didn't ask a lot of questions right mm -hmm. so we ask a lot of questions. We tend to ask a lot of questions these days. You know, when it comes to vaccine, is it safe? Is it gonna give us COVID? Um, is it gonna hurt? You know, I don't our questions in our for God. He tells Nathaniel that he's gonna see the ascending and descending of the Son of God. And you were talking about Jacob and mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. kind of like Jacob's dream of the stairway to heaven, Genesis 28, 12. And uh, where he sees the angel descending. Yeah, yeah. That's a strange story, too. Yeah. He's supposed he had to a lie. dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Hmm. He was struggling because he knew he was going to meet his brother. <laughs> yeah. What it was, brother, what was his brother going to say to him? You know, God, but the angel of the Lord came to him. I mean, sometimes I think maybe God, God comes to us and demands that we wrestle with him so that there's growth that happens, maturity that happens as a result of that. Um, I don't know. Well, no. I mean, that was a, that story uh, of Jacob and of Israel, you know, is, is one that would have been ingrained in, um, in, the, in the people. Um, it was, a, you know, it was a story of the Pentateuch, which, you know, every especially every Israelite boy, but mostly every Israelite child was expected to have the Pentateuch memorized by the time they were 10, 11 years old. So, 
I thought that's what catechism was bad. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot so, of memorization. Yeah. As a so pastor friend, was... she does biblical storytelling. You took a class on that, on how to memorize Bible passages. Oh, really? So, yeah. I'm always so there's story to throw Bible passages out of me. Yeah. And I tell you, I had a discussion one time with some atheist students from uh, UNL. Oh, no. And they knew the Bible better than I did. Yeah. You know, and they, you know, well, what about this? Well, you know, I, well, the devil quotes scripture. Right. <laughs> Not that they're the devil, but. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it, but I, I think, it. you know, but they, then they identified that with a certain place. And to me, what Jesus is saying is, you take the time, you take the time to be with me, you are going to see this in many different places, mm -hmm. not in just one place. You know, greater things, greater things are that, no, we don't, God isn't limited to one, God isn't limited by space. You know, I think that's, um, we, we have a tendency to, as humans, we have a tendency because that's how we define our lives is through space. And, and we have, we have a tendency to want to put God in a, in certain spaces, in certain places, uh, you know, and that's how we want to define God and Jesus is saying here, no, that isn't what's <laughs> that isn't what this is about. But you you take the time to be with me, you will be surprised by what what surprised. you will see. Surprised by grace. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I got a sermon started for Sunday. <laughs> Thank you all very much for that. <laughs> The greater things, I mean, you know, we tend to focus on the smaller things, right? God wants us to focus on the bigger things. You know, I mean, what's going on in Washington right now is to some, to some degree uh, a result of human beings focusing on, on smaller things mm -hmm. instead of greater things. And uh, well, in, in many, uh, many people it, it just shows that many people can be misguided by a charismatic personality. Yeah. And, you know, and, and the power of somebody like that. And, you know, and, and back in the, the day of Jesus, there were, there were other charismatic personalities who came before Jesus. And John the Baptist was kind of one of them. Right. Only he pointed to the right thing. Right. And, you know, I, I can remember 10, 15 years ago, uh, ABC had a special on, on Jesus. And it was, I thought, oh, Jesus is going to be an attempt to, you know, ruin it. But they, they pointed to the fact that he was the only one of all these charismatic people who uh, his following has kept today because, you know, things that he talked about really happened and uh, mm. so it was but i think of jim jones and that saying drink the kool-aid I mean, <laughs> you know uh a lot of people did and they they paid a heavy price for it <clears throat> yes yeah well good conversation uh appreciate Appreciate your thoughts and your faith. And those of you on Facebook Live, uh, greetings and uh, prayers. Peace be with you and prayers for, for you as well. I, I would just, um, yeah, ask you to keep, uh, I, I talked to Rick yesterday, Rick Miller, and Rick had heard from Pastor Gail Madsen, and she's having a real... Um, a real struggle right now because not only with her Parkinson's, uh, mm. that is uh, 
creating a good deal of anguish for her, but also um, her sister um, developed ovarian cancer uh, this summer and uh, was uh, was dead within two months of being diagnosed with uh, ovarian cancer. So she's she's also uh, dealing with the grief and of having to then because her sister is the one who lived with her parents and her parents are uh, then had to be moved into assisted living uh, and. So she's been through a lot in the in the past, uh, not just from the pandemic, but through just family uh, things going on in her family in the last uh, well sub since September. Uh, well, July is when her her sister was first diagnosed. So please put please keep Pastor Gail um, please keep Pastor Gail in your prayers. Well, it sure will. Well, let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power. I look forward to seeing everybody here in this room shortly. <laughs> yeah, get your vaccine. Yeah. Bye, everybody. <laughs>